Hey, Fellowship of Congregational Church uh, Network, group of churches, people who are tuning in. Uh, it's so great, isn't it, to be able to sit here and gather, um, even scattered, even maybe remotely, even via Zoom or via YouTube or whatever you're watching this from. Um, isn't it amazing to gather as God's people, as God's church, as a network of churches that God has called? And we have so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful for as a group of churches, particularly as we reflect over the last year or so. It's been challenging, undoubtedly. There's been hard things, but there's been amazing ways in which God has lifted us up as well and built up our, our fellowship and really given us a hope and a picture for things going forward. And so let me just thank you first and foremost for joining us, for, for tuning in. Um, in case you don't know me, my name is Tim Foskett. I'm employed a couple of days a week as the Fellowship of Congregational Church's General Secretary slash Ministry Director. And let me just yeah, give my heartfelt welcome and, and, and thanks to you for joining in and, and celebrating with us um, as we think both about the year that's passed, but also as we look towards the future. Um, it's great to have you with us. Of course, we do need to wrestle with that fact, don't we, that this year has been really, really hard. Indeed, the last 18 months have been really, really hard. Perhaps that's actually reflected ongoing strains and stresses and hardships for you, both in church but in ministry. Maybe ministry isn't what you thought it would be. Maybe church life isn't what you thought it would be. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves getting quite despondent and discouraged and despairing in those situations when we're given challenges, when we get faced with hardships, when we're faced with disappointments. It reminds me of a conversation I had many, many years ago now when I was teaching. I used to be a full-time high school teacher. And there was a good friend I had who was, on, um, who was in my staff room with me. I won't say her name, but she was probably four, five, six years older than me. So a bit wiser, a bit longer in the tooth. She was married at the time. I was single. Um, I think she had a kid. I'm not really sure. But a bit more wise. And I remember it was kind of tw towards the end of term towards the end of the year, everyone's tired, everyone's a bit more philosophical, everyone's a bit run down, looking forward to the holidays. I remember something that she said to me, we were sitting in the staff room, just the two of us once, and just chatting and being a bit reflective, like I said. And she basically said something that stuck in my mind ever since. She said that when we're young, we're told that this world is this amazing, wonderful, beautiful place, this joyous place, this joyous adventure. And that getting old is more and more realizing that the world will let us down, that life and experience on this earth is not what we thought it would be, that life will ultimately not bring us the joy and the satisfaction and the peace that we hoped it would. And I remember, like I said, I was probably 26 at the time and she was in her early 30s. I'm like, wow, that seems like a bleak attitude. That seems like an unnecessarily negative attitude. But surely that fits our experience to some degree. Surely church, life, relationships, even marriage, even you know, different experiences, even your relationship with other people in your family, even your job maybe, has let you down. It's not what you hoped it would be. And if anything, COVID has intensified some of those natural expressions and feelings that we all have, this disappointment, this discouragement this dissatisfaction with life and existence really on this planet. This is a universal reality. What does the Bible say about these things? What does the Bible say about these realities? There's so much we can learn as a group of churches and as a fellowship of churches. I would say, well, I would think Paul would say, is that we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. I think the Bible, and one of the things I pre appreciate most about the Scriptures is that it has an unflinching, look at both human nature, but also about creation and about existence on this planet. It has a realistic picture of, of life on this planet, of ministry serving in a broken world, of trying to be God's church in a, in a world that's fundamentally opposed to him. And if you don't believe me, read John chapter 3, 16. You know, the world was opposed to him. The world rejected God, rejected Jesus. The Bible has an unflinching picture of the world. 
And so when the world lets us down, when life lets us down, when, we things, when the things that we put hope in let us down, we shouldn't be surprised. I think is what Paul is encouraging us to sort of understand today. And I think we need to take this to heart as a fellowship. But I, need, I think I need to be clear here. It's not the path to despair. It's not the path to sitting there and living in a dark, a dark hole and locking ourselves away and just thinking there's no hope at all. We're going to finish with a, a picture of beautiful hope. But really, Paul gives us three proofs or three evidences or three, I'm going to use his word, three groans that point to what we should really expect in this life, to what church life should look like in this life, to what serving God should look like in this life, to what being a Christian should look like in this life. And I love this passage, Romans 8 really preaches itself and this is a beautiful passage in and of itself. And like I said, I think it's unflinching in its realism but it's also beautiful and it's hope as it, as it sort of points us towards the end. And so what's this first groan, this first proof, this first evidence that Paul's, Paul talks us, what Paul takes us to? The first, I think, is what we see in the created order, what we see and experience in our world around us, the broken, fragile world. Let me read from verse 18. If you have your Bibles, I'd be stoked if you could follow along. Um, otherwise, it'll come up on the screen. Um, verse 18, these are the words of Paul coming from Romans 8. Remember, he's talking to a church that's suffering under persecution and hardship. Um, most historians think the real um, persecution by the Romans came after um, Paul wrote this, probably about 10, 20 years after, but things were still really hard for Christians. And we can read about that in other parts of the Bible. We'll read about that in 1 Peter, for example. And this is in the, po- the pagan center of the ancient world, ancient Rome, where people were deeply opposed to Christian belief, even in an unorganized kind of relationship, localized level. So people are suffering, people are finding it hard, people are struggling as followers of Jesus. But look at Paul's words here to encourage them. He's been doing it all through chapter 8. But look what he says here in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Our present suffering. So he's ad- identifying that, but he's comparing it to what's going to happen in the future. Verse 19. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, interesting words, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Wow, some massive things that Paul's just kind of put into that passage there. But look at these evidences of the, of the situation, which I'm, to, to some degree I, I know that you're experiencing. I know I'm experiencing some of these things. The hardness of the world as it is, the, the brokenness of the, of the created order. Look what he says here. Um, suffering, so I talked about that a second ago, the present suffering, so we're in suffering, persecution for the Roman church. But look what he says in verse 19. Creation's waiting in eager expectation for something better. And what's that look like? Well, it's being subjected, verse 20, subjected to frustration. Some translations say subjected to futility, pointlessness, emptiness, barrenness. And maybe you've experienced that in ministry, serving your church. You don't know what the heck is going on. You don't know what what you're doing. Is there any fruit? Work is not satisfying you. Um, And he goes on, creation itself is under bondage to decay. It's falling apart around us. It's, it's, it's decaying in our very midst. And maybe you've experienced that. And, and I know I'm 40 years old. Um, I don't know if this is news flash for some of you. But I feel that. I feel that when I walk upstairs, my knees make funny noises because of injuries I did 20 years ago. You know, I wake up, and this never happened when I was 15 years old, by the way, but I wake up and I'm sore. And I'm like, how did that happen? I've been sleeping all night. (laughs) Why am I waking up sore? It's because I'm part of this broken creation. It's because I'm part of this existence. It's because I'm in a world um, that needs to be liberated from its bondage, Paul's words, bondage to decay that is subjected to frustration, futility, that is in the midst of present suffering. 
And all these words, I really think, are take, us, take us back to, I think Paul has this in the back of his mind as he's writing to Genesis 1. You might remember the early parts of Genesis 1, how, how creation was perfect and beautiful. And he has this refrain, refrain that the writer of Genesis uses again and again and again. It is good, it is good, it is good. And then, it's not just Adam um, who's, who's cursed, but it's all creation, or Adam and Eve who's cursed, but it's all creation who's cursed in chapter 3 because of Adam's sin. I think it sort of points towards this kind of language, futility, bondage to death, bondage to decay. Verse 22, in the pains of childbirth, groaning. One translator says, sighing, throbbing, in pain. Is that your experience here in October, or what are we, Um, September of 2021? Are you throbbing, groaning for something better? I think Paul's saying, hey, the Bible is here, and recognizing you and pointing to this present felt experience. Indeed, this is the present existential felt experience of everyone on this planet. I'm reminded of um, you know that famous scene from the movie The Lion King. Um, Simba's on like a mountaintop with his dad. I think it's Mustafa is his dad, and and um, and the, Mustafa's saying, "Hey, you know, you, you're going to be king of all this one day. This is all going to be your kingdom, your dominion." And Simba looks and sees you know creatures getting killed and hunted and being eaten, and um, and he asks, "Well, isn't that a bad thing?" And and obviously Simba's dad goes, oh, well, it's all part of the circle of life. And they sing a song and, you know, the, the antelope is eaten by the lion, but then ultimately the lion itself will, will, will die and fertilize the ground and the antelope will come and eat the grass that's been fertilized by the lion. And so it's this kind of cycle of life and it all sounds pretty and it all sounds beautiful and it all sounds amazing. And that's until we see something that's dead, until we experience death, until we see the bondage of decay, the rot, the darkness. And again, I'm speculating and I can't know the heart of God, but I wonder if COVID-19 is really a picture or really a puncture in this kind of bubble of illusion that we present ourselves and inoculate ourselves with in Western Australian society. Very affluent, very comfortable. We're not really super in touch with the reality that things are dying that we are not immortal, but mortal, that we can get sick, that we are frail, that loved ones can pass away, that we can pass away. We inoculate ourselves. And I wonder if in God's purposes, COVID is just reminding us that we are part of this broken, broken, created realm. A podcast I listen to quite regularly, a guy called Mark Sayers, who's a kind of a thinker, but also a pastor down in Victoria, basically has said that he, he, he'll probably um, come from a slightly different theological persuasion than many of us. But basically, he argues that God is using COVID to remind us that we're not immune to the brokenness of our created world, that we're not somehow separate, that we're very much still under bondage of decay. We're very much still subject to the futility of which the curse has brought upon all things in this planet. Indeed, we are in the pains of childbirth while we long for something better. Perhaps that marries and mars and shapes and really reflects your experience. So that's the first proof that Paul really takes us to, what we see and experience in creation. The second proof, and again, this is even more startling, is what Christians experience. And so remember, Paul's talking really broadly, very, very broadly, um, about just everyone, everyone, everyone's existence on this planet. Everyone exists this to some degree. And then he focuses it into Christians. And rather than being exempt from some of these hardships and some of these sufferings, I think Paul's saying some of these hardships and sufferings are actually intensified. And so if you're having a hard time in this period, in this season, in this section of life brought about largely by COVID, but also all this instability and brokenness that comes with that, I think Paul would say, hey, read Romans 23. Look what he says here. Not only so, but we ourselves, we ourselves, he's talking about followers of Jesus here, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, people who have the indwelling Spirit 
Look what he says here next. It's amazing. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. And so what's another witness or evidence or groan pointing to the brokenness of this world? Well, that's what Christians experience. And sometimes Christians like to paint themselves as being immune to the brokenness of creation, to the frailty of of, of creation. But Paul's saying in many ways we feel these things even more deeply. One translator says that because we have the Spirit, now whether you agree with this person or not, it's another question, because we have the Spirit, because we're Jesus followers, we feel these things even more deeply. Dick Lucas, the famous British pastor theologian, says it's basically sums it up in a really neat way. He says it's because we're half redeemed. We've been given a glimpse of future glory. We have the first fruits of the Spirit indwelling in us, and that's what Paul has been building up all the way through Romans, particularly in Romans 8. And yet we're half redeemed. We're longing for something better. We're longing for, I think Paul's saying it, for the new creation. We're longing to be taken out of this world that's subject to decay. We're longing for the creation to be redeemed along with our bodies, along with our hearts and our spirits. We're half redeemed, Dick Lucas would say. Verse 26, look what he says here again, quite startling. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't even know, we don't even know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Even Christians, even those with the indwelling spirit, don't even know necessarily what to pray for. We just have to sometimes open our hearts in agony and suffering to God. I think this is an astounding passage, and I think it for this reason. I think Paul is giving Christians permission, permission not to have it all together. I think Paul is giving us permission to struggle, to satisfy. It really puts a bit of a a challenge to this idea, and I'm just going to call it triumphantism, this idea that, oh, you're in Christ and everything's going to be amazing and you're going to walk through the life with power and the spirit and you're going to win and you're going to succeed and everything's going to be great and your bank accounts are going to be great and you're going to have a hot spouse and amazing kids who are going to be perfect all the time. And, And Paul would say, no, it's rubbish. Permission to struggle. And I think we experience that struggle, really. And if we're going to be completely honest with the Fellowship of Congregational Churches, we are a small denomination. Some people would love for us to be bigger and more powerful and more weighty in the Christian sphere. Sometimes it feels like the future is uncertain. How do you deal with that? Honestly, just think for a second. Think for a moment. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you deal with that? Maybe church isn't where you want it to be. Maybe ministry isn't where you want it to be. Maybe you started up a youth ministry and you had no kids and you've been praying, you've been training people to, to step up to leadership and after a year you might have one kid or two kids and they're the kids that you know people in your church their parents happen to send their kids and force them to go. You're not seeing the growth that you would like. We feel the groan. We feel the heartache. We feel the frustration. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should settle for that. I'm not saying we shouldn't point to something greater or bigger and hope and plan for bigger things for the FCC. I think I believe in my heart that we can and do and should plan for those things. I believe that very much. But I also think there's a sense in which we are given permission to grieve in hard times. Perhaps COVID has made the the future of your church and your ministry and your job uncertain. Even the best Christians, even the best, to some degree are subject to bondage, to fear and anxiety and hardness of heart. Even the best. Even the best churches, they experience conflict, they experience egos, they experience fights, they experience division, even the best, and I know that from experience, even the best people get sick, get discouraged, they get old, they die. You know, there's parts of following Jesus that aren't 
going to be fun. And I guess the question I would ask is, are you convinced you're doing it wrong? Are you convinced somehow that you're messing it up, that you're not doing it the right way? I have this um, ongoing joke with, with my dad that um, I, one of the things that frustrates me about buying furniture is so much of it is, you know, it comes kind of flat packed, you know, because I assume it's cheaper and all that sort of stuff. And it annoys me because you buy it and then you effectively need to go home and build the jolly thing. I'm like, well, if you're going to buy something, it should come built. I'm old fashioned like that. But apparently that's not the way the world works, at least in terms of furniture. And the reason it kind of freaks me out, and you see this with Ikea furniture, is because if you build it and you build it wrong, well, you're not going to have a good time. <laughs> what if you, you use that little key thing they give you and you don't tie it up properly or you, you miss out a screw or you leave a part missing or you, know, you put it all together and there's bits left over in the packet and you're going, what the heck, am I doing it wrong? Have I made a wrong turn? Have I put this together poorly? Is that how you're feeling in ministry? Am I doing this wrong? Am I not doing a good job? I wonder if Paul would just give us permission to sit there in the hardness and the, and the ambiguity and the uncertainty of it. I think and Paul's kind of laboured at this point. So that's the first or second rather proof or groan that Paul talks about. And the third one I think is just as surprising. So he's spoken about you know, the suffering and the brokenness in creation. Then he's spoken about how that is experienced even in Jesus' followers, people who call themselves you know, Christians, people who have the indwelling spirit. They feel that. But also the third evidence that there's something broken and wrong with this world and we shouldn't be surprised is really what the Holy Spirit testifies and shows us and points to. I'll take this back to verse 26. Look what it says here. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit, um, the third part of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes through us through wordless groans. Verse 27, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And so we shouldn't be surprised that God is fully aware of the brokenness of this world, are fully aware of how hard it is to be a Jesus follower in Australia, in Sydney, in 2021, or even anywhere in the world, by the way. Indeed, the Spirit himself recognises those things and intercedes for us. I love what it says there in the second half of verse 26. The Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. We don't even know what we want to say or how we want to say it. We just know that living in this world sometimes is really, really hard. <laughs> and, and rather than us thinking that we need to pretty up our language or pretty up our words, we can just sort of groan inwardly to God in prayer and bring it forth to Him. And the Spirit will intercede. He says that twice. And He who searches our hearts, He knows our motivations, He knows what we really want to say, he knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in, the, in accordance with with the will of God. A lot of people would point to the mystery of what Paul's talking about here. And I think there's supposed to be a mystery. But even the deepest, most almost unspoken longings of our heart are brought to God. And somehow the Spirit intercedes for those things. The Spirit acknowledges that life in this world is hard. But luckily, it doesn't leave us in despair. Indeed, it's through the Spirit that we have a hope for something better. Look what it says in verse, and this wasn't in the reading. Um, look what it says in verse 11. And again, it echoes what Paul says elsewhere. So the Spirit's interceding for us. The Spirit's acknowledging the brokenness of our existence and the brokenness of living in a COVID-saturated world. But look what it says in verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead raised Jesus from the dead, brought him back to life after a horrible death on the cross, had been buried in the tomb for three days, raised him from the dead. He lives in where? Where does he live? He lives in you, he lives in me, he lives in people who follow Jesus. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. In other words, the spirit doesn't just intercede, as important as that is. Ultimately, the spirit's going to redeem 
our bodies and our hearts, make them perfect before Jesus. He's really talking about the new age, when all creation will be made new, where heaven will come down. Bono, who's in U2, and I'm not trying to use U2 as a perfect picture of good theology, don't get me wrong, but he has it in one of his songs, when all the colours will bleed into one. And you can almost hear the longing and the desire in Paul's language. That's what he's talking about earlier in the passage here in verse, uh, verse sorry, I just got to find my notes here, verse 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation for what? And this is basically the same nugget of idea or thought that he's talking about. For the children of God to be revealed. For the second age, uh, second age the age to come, verse 21. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. The Bible's been pointing to this all along. All through the Old Testament, I think it's even hinted as early as Genesis, by the way. But I'm going to read a couple of random passages from Isaiah which talk about this very reality. Um, The desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom and bloom. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will die down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. It's the new age. It's the time when there will be no suffering and brokenness. No bondage to decay. When I'll, I don't know if I'm going to sleep, but where I'll get up from sitting on a chair and not hurt. Where I can walk upstairs and my knees won't make funny noises. Where I don't have to worry about things like COVID. Where I don't have to worry if I'm going to have a job next year or next month or next week. (laughs) What an amazing, beautiful picture that is that Paul points us towards. At no point, at no point has Paul given us this unrealistic view of what this world is like and what following Jesus in this world is like, at no point. But he doesn't leave us in despair. He acknowledges hardship and pain and suffering and uncertainty, undoubtedly. But he points us to the beautiful, beautiful future we ultimately have in Jesus. Do you need to be reminded of that beautiful picture and all things will be made new. Uh, just to finish up, I'm recently, um, I've recently re-watched the Lord of the Rings movies. They came out in the early 2000s. Now, I love the Lord of the Rings. I love the novels. Um, it's been really cool. I think the movies are good. I don't think they're perfect, but I think they're really, really good. I watched the extended editions, by the way. If you're into those movies, I would say go read the original novels. Um, the guy who wrote them, J.R.R. Tolkien, was actually a Christian. And there's this beautiful picture, and like I said, I'm going to finish with this. There's this beautiful picture um, towards the end of the third novel of The Lord of the Rings where two characters, one is Gandalf, he's this wizard with bright, uh, great white long hair, this other character called Sam, and they'd been split up and everyone thought Gandalf had been, had been killed, but he has, wasn't actually dead. And they're reunited And this is what happens. This is what he says um, when they see each other again. He says this, Gandalf, this is the words of Samwise Gamgee. Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? A great shadow has departed, answered Gandalf. And then he laughed and the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. And as he listened, the thought came to Sam that, he, Sam that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment, for days upon days without count. Is everything sad going to come untrue? I think it's a beautiful picture of the age to come. It's a beautiful picture of why we're in ministry. It's a beautiful picture of why the fellowship of congregational churches exists. We're taking people and pointing people and and, and proclaiming the name of the one who will bring this age to come when everything sad is going to come untrue. That's exactly what Paul's been talking about. Let me just read what he says as I finish. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. 
when everything sad is going to come untrue. Hopefully that's encouraging to you as we both look towards the future, as we grieve over the situation and, and the year that has passed, but also hope both and wait in an eager, eager intense anticipation of, of, the, of the age to come, but also what God's going to do in our fellowship over the next bunch of years.